Hey everyone, David Staub here with the Magical Stories of Healing and Spiritual Gifts podcast, and I just wanted to take a second and say thank you all so, so much for listening in and being part of our community. Megan and I both are so grateful for every one of you, all your support in this movement, and we did want to take a minute and let you know that we will never charge for our podcast. We want this information out there free, and it helps start changing the world. That being said, we do want to take a second and let you know about some of the products that we believe in that we're using. One of those being Anchor, which you're listening to right now. Uh, If you've never heard of Anchor, it's literally the easiest way to make a podcast. It's totally free. Megan and I didn't know how to make a podcast before. We use it. It's free. It actually lets you record podcasts right from your phone or your computer, and it automatically distributes the podcast for you to be heard on Spotify, Apple, Apple Podcasts, Google, all over. And you can also make money from it too. There's no minimum listenership. It's everything you really need to make a podcast to one place. So if you've ever thought about making a podcast, go to anchor.fm and sign up to get started. Have a great day. And I'm looking forward to continuing to learn from every one of you. Hey, Sean, are you there? Yeah. Hi, David. Oh my gosh. Uh, it is such an honor to talk to you on here. Thanks for making this work for us, man. Okay. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, th- I mean, thanks for having me, man. It's awesome. Uh- Absolutely. So I'll go ahead and do my intro here. So, uh, hey, everyone, welcome to the Magical Stories of Healing and Spiritual Gifts podcast. Uh, my name is David Staub. I'm here with my lovely wife, Megan. Hi there. And we are super honored to bring you someone that is just an incredible human being. I've been following him. And Shauna, I think I connected with you a few years back, actually, on Instagram. Uh, Maybe he two just years put ago. <laughs> about two years ago. Yeah. yeah out such inspirational stuff and committed to just putting out love and gratitude and just constantly uh, a um, a student of his craft and he's you know taken something like such as addiction and turned it into not only uh, personal successes but so many professional successes man I've been following you for a pretty long time and uh, I just got to say I appreciate you making time for us uh, Sean Casey is also the founder of Gift of Addiction which is su- I can't wait to get into this because that's such a cool concept that's yeah. so backwards <laughs> to what society is all about. So uh, yeah, welcome, man. man. We're so happy to have you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great to be here. And um, anytime I have an opportunity to, you know, share my story and, uh, you know, share share the truth, you know, and uh, share the spread the message, um, I'm, I'm always here and ready. Awesome, man. Well, again, we, we appreciate it. We're happy to uh, dive dive in here. And I actually, um, you know, that's something this is, I'm, I'm really interested in this one too, just because I battle with addiction for a lot of my life. I'd say the first 28 years, heavy, heavy and binge drinking yes. uh, with, with, with alcohol. That was my big one, man. I use that as, as, as an escape and it just, right. led to, it was just, it, it just led to so many horrible things, but uh, it's, you know, I, I totally get the addiction aspect. So I guess to start out, man, um, yeah. tell us a bit about your childhood. How'd you grow up? Um, you know, like a lot of people, uh, <laughs> it was interesting. Uh, my mom was pregnant with me at 16. Uh, oh, wow. so she was in high school. And uh, yeah, 17 years old, she had me. And uh, a year and a half later, she had my brother. And by the age of three, she had uh, already divorced my dad. And my first uh, memory was uh, in a VW Bug going cross country from Connecticut to hit Ashbury, San Francisco. This is the late 60s, right? With the big uh, hippie scene, you know, love, sex, okay. God, rock and roll. Um, yeah. So that's, um, that's kind of where my first memories of my childhood began, you know, going cross country and then uh, living in the hate, you know, the whole hippie scene, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, my mom and uh, uh, stepdad at the time uh, were very involved with the, the whole movement. So um, I was right in the mix of a lot of LSD, smoke filled rooms and marijuana, having joints passed to me at, you know, four or five years old. And oh also, um, you know, also, uh, you know, kind of getting into the Bible. We had Bible study every weekend over in uh, Marin County. So we'd cross the Golden Gate Bridge and go over there. And so that was kind of my first, uh, you know, dive into any kind of spirituality. And it was, uh, it was happy times, believe it or not. Those were my happiest childhood times were when we lived there. We were, uh, we lived in a very small apartment, but you know, life was good, man. There were people yeah. were happy 
and uh, good things were happening. So um, that's where my early, early childhood began. And uh, yeah, um, do you have, want any insights? Do you want me to yeah. carry on? I mean, I can. Yeah, sure, man. So from there, uh, that's awesome, uh, by the way. I guess from there, when when did, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we found in, in launching this podcast and finding people that have dealt with some of these tough things in life is uh, not all of it, but a lot of it can be traced back to some trauma oh, they yes. may have dealt with at, at a at an early age oh, yeah. that uh, comes back in <laughs> in a very different way. Oh, scary yeah. form later on in life so what uh what, what traumas have you dealt with at, at uh in your younger years well uh my stepdad got ill so hmm. five almost six years old my mom was having my 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 her third son my half brother and she said listen you know your dad's not well we're gonna ship you back to connecticut with your biological father so my brother and i were put on an airplane and we flew back and my dad was engaged to get married so he had his uh, fiance her son he was a successful sales guy making tons of money brand new house brand new jaguar and cadillac in the driveway so total contrast so i went right you know, that's what i'm thinking i'm like whoa what so, a freaking shock but along with <laughs> the long what came with that was um, a lady that was very, very unhappy that his two biological sons were coming. And that is when the wrath mm. hit me. Um, my whole mm. life turned upside down and uh, a lot of abuse, uh, intense, mm. physical, emotional, mental. I mean, to the point of being tied and beat until passed out. You know, I, I don't know how elaborate you want me to get on here, but, um, you know, it was just, it was, uh, it was intense. Uh, my whole oh life my changed. Gosh. And, uh, you know, we didn't have any social. It was kind of like shopping every day, you know, the report. Anyway, it's just, um, I think, you know, the most important thing for listeners to know, there's just, you know, here was a young boy that, you know, it just shattered. I mean, it was right. continuous, uh, intense uh, abuse, childhood abuse. Man. And my dad couldn't help it, but let her win. Uh, hmm. with, you know, we're disrupting her life. He doesn't have to deal with it. So she's going to be in control of the situation. And then, of course, you know, he chimed in and kind of went, you know, did what he did, too. So um, that was kind of the the beginning of the end for me as far as wow. <laughs> emotionally yeah. and mentally. And uh, mm -hmm. two years later, my my mom and my stepdad and my half brother came out to visit us. And by the time she left, she was just in tears, my stepdad said, and that she mm. knew she had to get us out of there. Mm. Uh, so fast forward, we uh, within a few months after being there a couple years, uh, we moved in with her and her mom's. They didn't have enough resources to buy a house. So we ended up living in a middle, nice middle class neighborhood with, with my grandmother. But for whatever reason, um, the transition of even though there was a lot of abuse and unhappiness and craziness, uh, mm -hmm. you know, had a good lifestyle with my my real dad. And so yeah. I went back to having nothing again. And I kind of looked down on my stepdad for that. And for mm. whatever reason, that triggered him. And the abuse continued, man. Oh, I no. Mean, I was by second, let's just bother, by second grade at seven years old, I was that kid that was going to school with bruises all over him. And they didn't know what was going on with me. They put me Gosh. in therapy. They put me there. And then so that is when I call. Um, I have totally went from early high childhood trauma to disconnection, isolation, and survival. Um, mm. I, I couldn't trust anybody. You know, the people that are supposed to love you abuse me. My mom didn't protect me, so I couldn't trust her. Um, the only saving grace I had was my grandmother. She was somebody that was kind of like an angel, man. She just, um, she was there for me. You know, she was the one kind of saving grace through my early childhood that kind of went back as much as, I mean, even to the point faking she had heart attacks and stuff just so some of the beatings would stop, you know, so. Uh, oh, what yeah. an angel. Man, you know, for me, my childhood, my release was sports. That's where I could kind of, I, I was very, uh, I was a great athlete. Yeah. So that kind of got me out in, in, you know, my head and gave me a release. And um, what else? Yeah, man. Say? That's... And then, of course, because of that, right? the authority figures, the first 30 figures in your life, I, um, you didn't want to be my teacher. Any authority figure Ooh. got a wrath from this kid. 
I mean, oh, man, I was man. always in trouble. So it's kind of funny, right? You know, <laughs> you get abused, but then I just looked for that negative attention, right? In my mind, I had already a belief that I was a screw up. So what did I do? I continued to screw up, right? You know, yeah. Didn't, you know, in school I screwed up. But I was always getting in trouble out of school, into mischief, and uh, hanging out with the wrong people, and uh, it just continued. And then by sixth grade, you know, I had my first drink, and mm. when well, my first conscious drink, my dad said at three yeah. I had my first drink. <laughs> so wow. I went to a bar and drank a whole beer. So, and then of course at five years old, I. You know, back in Haight Ashbury, I had a week, but consciously, first drink, yeah. sixth grade, felt awesome. Yeah, you know, my energy was there. I could be myself. I came out of my shell. I didn't feel any of the anxiety, the depression, the you know that I went my daily life with, right? And so yeah. that kind of kicked it off. You know, by that time, um, seventh grade, and then we moved to a rural, and I started just hanging out with older people, and all I cared about was getting high you know went from right. alcohol to marijuana to pills to you know it just accelerated um yeah and of course school went i was living back and forth not living at home living with friends and um yeah it just um it continued and um yeah man that's that's for i mean that's and as a kid you got to be like it's 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 so tough to fathom because it's like why you know you're so young right. you have no idea why the heck this is happening like you didn't right. do anything wrong so there's all these cycle I mean I don't know if you heard Megan's story but she yeah, had a your story resonates big time with me I mean my yeah. mom was you know she had me at 17 my grandmother saved me also and I was yeah. severely abused as a child for many years right. and like listening yes. to your story I'm like oh man I freaking get it I get like what you went through and why you acted out in the way you did because I would go to my grandmother's in the summer and they'd be like she's not the same little girl and I would like yeah. throw tantrums and man I, it's crazy to listen to your story it really oh, is yeah I'm listening I'm sitting here I'm like this is just like me well, yeah, well my, my upcoming book you'll there'll be more details and more other stories, but you know, the gist of it is that, right. You know, I, right. was, I was traumatized as a kid. And then what do you do? You start acting out And my, you know, as they say, by seven years old, your subconscious mind is hardwired. And wow. so my, wow. my limiting beliefs were in full tilt, low self-esteem, insecurity, and anger. I was yeah. so angry yes. as a young kid. And so, you know, I just acted out that anger always, which got me into trouble. And then, oh, yeah. um, I didn't, I ended up long story short, my, my dad, my stepdad, I guess was dealing drugs. I didn't really know that. Hmm. And at age 16 or 17, um, uh, I came home. My mom was really stressed. I'm like, what's going on, mom? Oh, nothing, nothing. And then finally she's like, well, yeah, your dad's doing a deal. He's going to make a lot of money, but he's not home yet. He was supposed to be home a couple hours ago. Oh my like, God. You know, I said, everything's going to work out. I said, just chill. I went in the bedroom with my girlfriend. And about 45 minutes later, my mom's like, get out, get up here, Sean. <laughs> and there's two DEA agents um, at the door with my stepdad. They're walking up. We had to oh, leave the house. Shit. So he got busted for a couple, I don't know, I guess it was a couple trash cans full of hashish. And, um, oh at the time of course marijuana hash it's, it was illegal it was big time i mean that's um, yeah so he was going to go to prison and so instead of going to prison he decided to take off he was from edinburgh scotland and he had citizenship in europe so he um he scooted man it's be just before he was supposed to go to court he uh he left the country and then uh, my brother went to california with some friends family friends and then my my youngest brother stayed with my my mom and I went back to my grandmother's in West Hartford, a suburban town in Connecticut, out of the rural area. But I was so into my addiction, I couldn't hold the job. I was stealing money wherever I was, my grandmother's mm. jobs. Dropped finally, you know, one day in school, I'm like, what am I doing going to school? <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. School because I would go to school and find people to go party with and then leave school. And that was a daily right. occurrence. So finally, I just said, you know, I got it. I'm dropping out. So I didn't, I started the 11th grade and by the third month of 11th grade, I was, I was done. Wow. And then someone gave me the idea. They said, Hey, they said, you know, if you're 17, you can go in the military. I mean, I was like, you know what? That might be a bad thing for a guy like me. You know, I don't know where the hell I'm going. I'm lost. Right. 
I'm drunk and high every day on something. I thought right. to myself, all right, we're going to do this. So I, first I looked at the Marines, then I was going to go in the Army, and then I took an ASVAB test. I did well on everything, but math needed a little help. So I got a tutor, retook the test. The only people that could get me in quickly was the Navy. They could get me in within six weeks. So I said, that's it. I'm going to the Navy. They could get me in six yep. weeks. Went and um, I was based in uh, San Diego, which was awesome because I always wanted to leave the East Coast. I hated the dark. I hated the winter. Hence, I'm living in Seattle, Washington. But that's another story. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, so there I went at 17. Uh, I had my mom to sign off and uh, went to San Diego boot camp. Got in a lot of trouble there, but I did finish boot camp. But it didn't matter. I, li- I loved it when I got in trouble because they, they just worked me out. They worked me out. And that's another thing, you know. <laughs> I started working out at 15, 16. I did athletics, but my dream after reading Arnold Schwarzenegger's book was to be a competitive bodybuilder and to run or own a gym. That was my dream. Go to California. So, you know, being over in San Diego, I was like, oh, God, I'm a little closer to really what I want to do. (laughs) But I was a long ways from that. And we went on, uh, um, it's called a Westpac. So I got on a Navy ship, went on a Westpac. And I decided not to uh, not to come back one day in the Philippines because Philippines is kind of like back then it was the adult Disneyland. I mean, yeah, sex, your got food, it. alcohol, drugs for hardly and any money. So if you don't mind me asking you real quick, I forgot to admit, I was going to ask <laughs> if anyone, if anyone listening. Um, <laughs> John Casey is absolutely um, champion bodybuilder uh, for anyone listening. I mean, just, just the epitome of a, a powerhouse of a bodybuilder. So when did all that start? Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt your story. I want you to continue there in the Philippines. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, uh, you know, for me, it was 15. So believe it or not, the catalyst for me starting to weight train, I think it was 15 or 16, 15, 16 years old, was one day my stepdad came out, called me a lazy F, F in this and F in that, and cool. said I was a lazy piece of shit and blah yeah. blah blah yeah and he said your brother's you know you're you're scrawny scrawny and then i was hanging out with some older guys that were lifting and drinking with and i said i started lifting the first day i was so sore i felt like my my chest was gonna rip and i was hooked and oh was yeah hooked. within a short time my body just responded and um then i got weights my i just it started from there and then i read arnold's book and it's like everything i let go in my life sports education but i continued even though i was a druggie i continued yeah. to lift man if i could make it yeah. to the gym everything was okay life was good i was going to survive it was just my my refuge my mental emotional spiritual refuge man it was just yeah no matter what's going on in my life if i get my workout in everything's going to be okay and so uh, yeah that's when it started when i was a teenager and it continued. It continued in the military. I worked out. And it's kind of like I got my self-esteem from that. I feel confidence because I looked good. I was strong. And so it was the one thing in my life. And it was also good for my mental health because, you know, I know more now what it does to the brain. But, um, yeah, so. You, you brought you brought that into the Disneyland of adults in the Philippines. All right. Back to the <laughs> Philippines. Yeah. So, so you, I, just, you just freaking stayed there. Like, what's, yeah, I was in the Marine well, Corps, by the it's, way. It's I was really, in the Marine Corps myself, so I'm trying to think of this. You just you just stayed. Please tell me about this. Yeah, you can't. It's unauthorized right. absence. You get in big trouble if you don't go to, back to work on the ship. So I hooked up with, you know, this girl hanging out with her, and she turned me on. I was looking for heroin. And then um, she had these pills that were similar to that. So for three days, I just hung out at her house and got high and and had fun. And uh, right. then I thought, well, we're leaving port in a few days. I'm going to get back. And so I had packed a bunch of drugs on me, a bunch of these pills. Fortunately, fortunately, this is, <laughs> fortunately, I had didn't have underwear for some reason, but I had a jock strap. It's so funny. I don't know why, but I had one. <laughs> so it enabled me to like pack it tight, you know, because anyone that's done sports knows a jock strap. It's right up in there. Oh yeah, I wrestled too. (laughs) But I'm going to a military base. So there's military cops, Marines, Navy, right there. And and I'm like saying, shoot, they're searching some of these people. So my my anxiety was to tell all these thoughts are going through my mind. None of them were good. I have anxiety right now listening to this. (laughs) So the closer I get to the base, I'm like, oh, my heart's going, everything. And then what do you think happens? I'm fearing the very thing that I feared. I got, they're like, shit, they're searching me. And I thought to myself, I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm going down. I'm in big yeah. trouble. 
I'm uh, constantly bringing drugs onto a military base. I don't know. I'm oh. not, what's going to happen to me? But they patted me down, and for some reason, I went through. They uh, me whoa. Me. What? And I was, I, it, I mean, I had like about six, seven of these. I mean, they're pills, but in this material, you know, plastic, whatever it was, but I, they just felt it. And because it was so connected to my body, I guess they just, I wasn't supposed to happen. So I wow. walk on the base wow. and the master at arms of the police of the, the Navy, because they showed my ID and they said, we need, we're, we're looking for you, the master at arms. So they handcuffed me, bring me up to the office. They P test me. Of course, I come up positive for drugs. They said, listen. You know, for what's going on with you, we could kick you out. But since this is the first time this has happened to you, we're going to give you an opportunity to go to drug rehab. And if you pass through that, you'll, you know, get back on your feet, get back into your work. So um, I went to drug rehab, but I had to stay on the boat a few, <laughs> a few <laughs> days uh, prior and I couldn't go out. I was restricted. So what do you think a guy like me did? I said, you know what? I'm going to connect with some of my friends and I'm going to have them bring a girl on board. So I can still oh, have my. fun, even though I can't. So <laughs> you'll read about that in my book, but it's just another I thing. I was going to, your I, mind, dude, I, I, your mind I, just, you have such an incredible mind. I, it's interesting to listen to how it's used for total getting with mischief in your early years. So here I that, am, that, right? That takes, that takes trouble, strategy. That drugs, takes intelligence I'm strategy. Thinking, <laughs> I'm still thinking somehow I'm going to get over on it. And, and it worked. Jeez. I bribed my friends for a couple of times and there was a little porthole up there. And, and uh, yeah. True story. Oh, so, um, but I went to rehab. I went over there. I flew over there from Philippines to uh, Miramar Base in San Diego Air Force Base, where they have a it was a six six eight week program. I think it was six weeks. And um, I did not think I was an addict. I was a young guy. I liked to drink and party, but I wasn't an addict. I wasn't an alcoholic. And of course. Small group. Let's talk about you know your family and everything. I'm like, oh, life, yeah. life is good, man. I didn't know what to talk about. <laughs> uh, but I had a good attitude. I had a great attitude. It was a great experience. Um, they had a PT test every week, you know, how many push-ups, pull-ups, the two-mile run. Um, and so anyway, I won it every week. And then the six weeks, they had the big thing, and I won the whole thing. So that, you know, I was I was happy, right? I could we had yeah. a workout thing going. And, um, but uh, at the same time, my last week there, this is something I've dealt with my whole life, is uh, – my, I couldn't almost get out of bed because my sciatica was so bad. And I've had issues with my spine since I was a kid. So that was kind of the beginning of my journey of trying to manage pain in my body. So um, that was kind of part of that journey. And you'll read about that. But um, yeah. Anyway, so I just want to fast forward here because, you know, this, I don't know if this is interesting to you guys or you want to ask me different <laughs> questions, but I'll continue my journey here, man. Yeah, man. Keep rocking. I'm loving this. This is uh, great. So I went through re I went through boot camp. Everything was good. They said, "All right, you're good." And um, one year, you're gonna get pee tested every week. And I'm like, oh, "That's cool, man. I can drink. I don't have to do drugs. Drinking's right. cool. I mean, I can just whatever. I can get over it." Yeah. So not too long, about a month after, we went out to sea for a, up to San Francisco for a couple of weeks. And uh, on the way back, my buddy's like, "Hey," he's like. You know, if you shoot cocaine in your veins, it will be out of your body within three days. It's going to be in oh, and out. It's not like you snorted it where it stays in your system. <laughs> so at first I was like, come on, man. That's, that's a guess, you know? And then I'm like, she's like, no. So of course, the, you know, my addict mind was like, all right, let's go for it. Maybe he's right, you know? I just justified it. So did that. It was like, I got super high, but it's, um, Monday, I go in for the P-test. Later that week, you need to go see the Master at Arms. I'm like, all right, I know what this oh, is about. Oh, shit. So I'm pop, man. Cocaine, positive for cocaine. Um, oh. At the same time this was going on, I had been hanging off base, and I had bumped into a teenage friend. Uh, no, yeah, a teenage friend that I had gone to high school with all the way out in San Diego. I was like, I couldn't believe it. And so I was partying with him and hanging out with him, and he was up to <laughs> he was up to some style. I was like, does this guy work? Not work. Anyway, he was um, he was what's called uh, hustling. Uh, yeah, hustling, and it's more like kind of gay for pay. Um, Got it. Okay. Stuff. And so 
he I was like, wow, what's that about? And so he I kind of kept connected with him because <laughs> after I got popped with cocaine, I spent the last 30 days in the brig. Oh, booted out. Yeah, I went to captain's mass and they're like, you're you know, you're out. You failed the test. I didn't get a dishonorable discharge. It got called an other than honorable. And I was kind of relieved. I mean, it was like I spent the last 30 days in the brig, the jail, and I didn't get any pay. I mean, I, I walked out, but I was a free man. I was walking off the base and I'm like, you know what? I got a new chapter. The It wasn't the military was not for me. Right. Uh, and you didn't get dishonorable. That's great. No. Yeah. So and I got my GED when I was in there. That was one of the first things I did. And so I was but I didn't have anywhere to stay. So Andy had set me up with this um, his friend. He said, listen, for a month, you can stay with my buddy. But then within a month, you know, you got to get on your, your two feet because I had I think I had six hundred dollars to my name. Yeah, I was, I was 19 at this point. And so I didn't know what I was doing. So I got a, I got a job. I couldn't hold on to that job. I got fired. I started doing more and more drugs. Mm -hmm. And then I started hanging out with some some girls that were into some wild S&M stuff and just in and out. I mean, this is just kind of where, where my, my life landed. And yeah. my friend was like, you know, you can, people are looking at you. People are interested in you. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I'm like, and I said, well, you know, I can't. I can't do that. I said, I'm, you know, I'm heterosexual. I can't, right, can't right. do that stuff. But I haven't really talked about this live like this. So this is like the first time you're going to read a lot of this in my book, but. Dude, uh, no, I appreciate the vulnerability. This kind of vulnerability uh, is hard as it is. And so, it's it gives it to other people. So. so that's, this is where my addiction, I couldn't hold a job. I couldn't have any money. And I said, all right, well, and he said, well, look at, I can, I can turn you on a, make a hundred dollars right now for just practically nothing and so i just said no i can't do it but i did i i fell into it i did that and then i was on the streets you know basically selling my body man and wow uh, and to um and the, and you know mo initially it was it was men and later on I'll, I'll continue and um so that's where my life was i mean i was basically hanging out with junkies yeah for a hundred dollars on someone's couch and then selling my body and so, so rough um i continue to do that and then i i kind of went through my own um exploration as far as what is my sexuality because it bothered right. me. just like mm -hmm. you know look i love women and i'm turn, I'm, I'm not into guys and i thought is it a mental block am i but it's not mm -hmm. really working and so you know i did my own research with somebody and i'm just like i'm just not but i guess this is where my life is. And you know what? The money's too easy. I'm just going to continue to ride this wave because it's working for my life right now. Yeah. So I hung out in San Diego. And then we, um, on the weekends, my friend said, listen, if you want to make real money, I can introduce some people in LA, Los Angeles. So I'm like, okay. So then I went up there and then I made as much money on a weekend on Santa Monica Boulevard. Cause that's kind of back in the eighties. That's where it all happened. Just like a block away from Sunset Boulevard. And um, I would go up there on weekends, make my money, come back to San Diego and party. Well, after a few weeks of that, I was like, what am I doing staying in San Diego? Right. And and then in the process, one night day out on the street, somebody, this guy drove up and he says, what are you doing on the street? And I said, you know what I'm doing? And he said, listen, why don't you jump in the car here and we're going to talk about you making some real money. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he's just threw a bunch of cocaine up my nose and he's just chatting with me. He says, listen, I run an agency. It's a high end agency and, you know, men, women, the whole thing. And, um, you know, I, if you want to work, I'll put you to work tonight. And so it's like, boom, my whole life just changed. I went from, you know, being on the streets to going to the, the finest hotels in Beverly Hills. Wow. And, you know, and, you know, and you're and I don't really drop a lot of names in my book because right. that's not what my book and story is about. But I saw a lot of, you know, Hollywood people, producers, actors, people that Whoa. you wouldn't even know, uh, you know, are into that stuff. So, um, but for me, it was like kind of like kind of mind blowing. It's like, you know, <laughs> you know, from yeah. that, and then uh, so I was more nervous about, you know, all these the, the glitz and the glamour. And I'm just like, geez, I'm just this kid 19 years old but okay i guess if you know people are in this and there's this money i'm just going to kind of continue so um 
that uh, I learned a lot about life. I learned so much. I mean, there's so much because nothing. Well, I had a couple bad experiences, but overall, I came out healthy through that whole journey. That you know, sex, and I got into not only prostitution, but I got into pornography, and um, but it didn't take me down. You know, I was able some. Uh, a girl came into my life who I almost married, and she was very influential to helping me out of the industry. Yeah, and, and um, you know, my passion was always, you know, the fitness, and so um, that's what I transitioned. You know, I got a job at, at the gym. I think I'm just gonna fast forward. I, I don't know how deep you want me to get into all that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my my question would be you. You mentioned there was a turning point. It was like this come to God moment that you knew that you had to change. Like, when did that happen? Okay. Can you talk me through that? Yeah, I sure can. So this is what I did. I got, all right, I got a job at the gym. In a very short time, well, and it was, I was just a floor trainer, I man. I was just saying, and I was still doing other stuff on the side. But one, a couple of the sales guys were out of town. I was taking tours and the general manager's like, how are you? closing all these sales i said what do you mean i'm just taking people around the gym and they're joining he goes that just doesn't happen you're you're doing something and you're closing sales so he's like i want you to sell and i'm like okay i want to i'll sell and then once he kind of was like yeah you can sell i was like all right i have a skill it was something i grabbed right onto so then i started reading the books even you know going to workshops starting to go to seminars and everything you know so i um um, became good at this my craft and my skill and and then it got to the point where somebody that was in the industry got a job at our gym in West Hollywood and said that when he left he says listen I've been around people and you are the best in the industry and this is the guy that won for like Bally's Fitness a national sales thing and he just said look at you you're better than I you you sell he says you should be making a shit ton of money I don't know what you're doing still sticking around here and I'm like oh all right yeah so I got my suit, got someone to help me with a resume. I tried to go look for other jobs, and I was still only 22 at this time. And so um, I didn't want to get in a suit. I love the gym business. That was my passion. That was my love. And so I just decided, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I don't want to go do sales for some company. I want to do fitness, and I want to stay in this business, in this industry. And then um, I remember someone said, well, why don't you make it a goal to have your, you know, be the general manager, part owner of your own gym. And I'm like, the guy's never going to leave. <laughs> yeah. And I chuckled because after I set that goal, four weeks later, I got a call from the owner. It was just basically the financial guy. He was never even there. And he said, I'm letting go of the general manager. He says, do you think you can run my business? And I said, of course I can. I know I can. I'm, yeah, let's go. Wow. So at 23, I got an opportunity to be general manager, part owner of, of a health club in West Hollywood. And so I was ecstatic. You know, I had read the books. I did the word. I set my goals. And so here it was, right? <laughs> I was living my dream. And wow. I didn't get into the bodybuilding because at this point I had already competed my friend that's a different story where I was strung out on heroin and I was in jail and then I you know I kind of had my first moment of truth and I said I wanted to run a gym of body and that was kind of the turning point that led me to where I am now um, and so here and then I was making more money than ever making and so about three four months into this position I mean I the gym couldn't go out he couldn't sell the gym the gym was in bad shape and I turned it around but after about four months into it, you know, I've been working my butt off. I thought, why don't I, I want to feel better. I thought, why can't I just go have a little bit of cocaine and a few drinks? Mm. That's what I thought. Yeah. And I thought, why not? It wasn't, it was bad. Things were great. I just wanted to help oh, me. I'm feeling good. I want to feel better. So yeah. I'm going to go do some coke. Well, fast forward six months from that, I was full blown back into my addiction again. Oh. Coke every day, free basing again, staying up vendors three nights in a row um, oh. all weekend turning on my employees to cocaine leaving a pile of coke in my office telling people hey man you want to go there and get a line you can blah 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 and oh. um, and uh so <laughs> one night in my office i um i just something clicked in me and i said look at man this is happening see that's what i like to tell people this is this all happened unconsciously I didn't wow. know that was going to happen. I thought, hey, I reprogrammed myself. I read all the books. I, I created this. Success. I manifested this. I am living the dream. Mm -hmm. Six months later, I'm going to lose it all. 
Yeah. I'm going to lose everything I had worked hard for. Yeah. And so that night, and I always, I didn't talk about this, but, you know, I've always had this connection. You want to call it with God, your spirit, whatever. And it, it, you know, obviously in my addiction, I was just kind of running unconsciously. But the connection was always there for me. It's just, yeah. I wasn't choosing to listen to it. And I wasn't choosing to really be guided by it. Mm. And so on that night, I looked at myself deeply in the mirror and I reviewed my whole life. And I said to myself, you know what? I am smart enough. I'm good enough, but I'm, I'm fucked up. I'm a, I'm an addict. I'm a drug head, man. I said, mm. there's no way I can change. I have a broken brain. How am I going to change my brain if it's broken? I said mm. to myself, the only way I can do this is by, <laughs> I got on my knees, man, and I prayed and I asked God, I said, listen, mm. I, said, I don't know how to live. I don't know how to love, but I need you to show me the way. And I was ready. Mm. I just, wow. that was it. That was my commitment to myself and to a new way of living. Cause I didn't know, like, I just didn't want to lose everything that I worked so hard for. And I didn't want to start over again. And looking at my reviewing my life and seeing my patterns of trying to get myself together only to fall back in this whole loop, this yeah. whole negative loop. And um, I didn't know. And I, so, you know, I started off, I called it early in my, in my spiritual journey, kind of my healing journey to loving myself because I didn't know how to love myself. I got abused as a kid and believe it or not, even though the drugs felt good, it was just another form of abuse. Yeah. And so, you know what I, so I talk about, you know, when you take away your addiction, that's why I don't believe addiction is a disease. I believe yep. it is a learned behavior. Now, can you get addicted to drugs physiologically, mentally, emotionally? Sure you can. But when you take them away and you detox and you get it out of your system and your brain becomes clear again, it's just a choice and then, yeah, it, but yeah. it's a learned choice. So it's so ingrained to you that when you get emotionally triggered, you go to that feel good thing. All right. I don't care if it's sex, if it's food, if it's, you know, drama, if it, whatever it is, yep. Yep. You know, whatever that thing that's going to make you feel good and, and back to your comfortable place where you've always been and always have gone. And that is what the addiction is. It's just a coping mechanism. So when you take that away, you must feel it. Wow. Your, your gift, your purpose, your, you know, your spirit, you must fill it with love, love mm. for yourself. And that doesn't mean, you know, all the pretty stuff that means, you know, personal accountability, looking hard at your life and the choices and decisions you're making on a daily basis. And that's why I call it, you know, the daily practice of being conscious, not only conscious of your intentions, of your purpose and moving forward and your goals. You have to be conscious of those limiting beliefs and those emotional triggers that have kept you going back and forth into your loop. You yeah. You have both. You can't fool it because I tried that. I did. I manifested mm -hmm. my dream only to end up sabotaging it almost a year later. Wow. How do you do that? You don't do it consciously, believe me, but it's so ingrained in you. You're more comfortable being that fuck up. Excuse me. Like that's. That's no, what I was more true. comfortable from. Yeah. It's like, I didn't deserve a good life. I didn't deserve to be making all kinds of money, having a good life, living my job, loving what I was doing. No, I wasn't good enough for that. I wasn't lovable, you know? Hmm. Wow. So on that night, and that began my whole new journey. And then a whole bunch of things came in order for me. I mean, so, you know, I, I ended up staying at the gym. I told the owner what I was doing. He said, great, as long as you can keep things rolling, Sean, just take care of yourself and do what you need to do. And I did. And then I made all his money that he lost, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I expanded the gym. And the deal was, once that happened, he would sell me the whole gym 100%. And he gave me that opportunity. Um, but, but about six months prior to that opportunity, him giving that to me, I had hired a weekend manager who did numerology, astrology, and a bunch of other things, even some kind of psychic stuff. And he validated, I had never been into this stuff and he did my charts and everything. And I didn't say a word to him and he validated it because my spirit was guiding me away from LA and the job, wow. I didn't know where I was going. And I was like, here I am, you know, I was gonna own the whole gym and business. And what would that lead to? I had investments going. I mean, I was a young guy, like I had things going on, but I was being guided away from LA, away from, you know, the gym and everything. And so I was very conflicted and wow, but I told myself, I said, 
I am going to follow my inner guidance. I'm going to follow God that was guiding me. And so, you know, I, I let it go. And, and another thing that happened to me, which I, I want people to hear this because they can maybe relate. I had never had a platonic relationship with a woman up to that point. And if you hung out, if I hung out with girls and we partied and we're, we're attracted to each other, we're going to sleep together. And so I had never not, not only had sober sex, but I didn't have girls in my life that I didn't have sex with. If you were my friend, we had sex. You know, yeah. and it wasn't that I pushed it on. It just happened. It was a natural thing. But what happened to me is going out on a couple dates sober. I went home with a date and, you know, in the midst of getting active and I would close it down. This little voice said, you don't have to be here. You don't have to do this. I did that to two people. And then I finally said, you know what? I can't do this to the women. And I can't do this to myself. I can't be putting myself in situation. So I decided that I was going to learn to have platonic relationships for women. And I did that for three years. Now, wow. I'm not saying that I'm saying that you have to do what I did, but I needed to do what I needed to do because I needed to learn how to have a real relationship, a non sexual platonic relationship with females. Wow. Um, and so that's when, so we sold the gym, somebody else. I got a chunk of money and I took a month holiday to Hawaii, Maui. And after a, a month, I was like, I'm single. I have money. Why do I need to go back to LA? Why don't I just live here? Yeah. So I decided to stay in Maui and I went through a lot, a lot of deep healing. I did a lot of workshops, a lot of spiritual energy work, a lot of, you know, stuff that in the box therapy and out of the box stuff, sweat lodges, you know, guided shaman stuff. So it's, um, that is did, awesome. I got into a lot of healing, but the thing about him is I lived for the first year or two on Maui, like a monk and I didn't need to, I lived in like a 300 square foot thing. I lived on a wood plank. Um, I, I bought this car that was just, they call them a Maui cruiser. I don't know why I went through this period where, I guess on some conscious level, I thought for me to be a spiritual loving person, I had to give up all material stuff, you know? And I mean, I'm sure other people have gone through this too, but I did. I just, I was reading a lot of Eastern philosophy, a lot of Buddha stuff and reading about monks. And I just was like, all right, I'm stripping everything and I'm not going to have anything, but just the basic needs. I'm going to eat, do this. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but then I came out of that and I was just like, listen, I don't have to suffer to be spiritual. Right. I can have a good life and I can be a <laughs> loving, good person. And, yes. Um, but you'll read about that. My book. It's just, it's, you know, it was my journey. I went, these are my experiences that I chose to go through to learn about myself and life. And, you know, I love so, that. but Maui was um, incredible. The first few years there were just a lot of deep healing, releasing a lot of trauma. Um, did any of that involve plant medicine down there? I heard you say shaman, um, so. You know, because I was so on my recovery journey from yeah. addiction, I just didn't, you know. I, I No, didn't. that's I mean, absolutely. So, but um, I know you mentioned that one of your questions. When I was younger, I mean, I, I did a lot of psychedelics and um, mushrooms and different things. Um, Dude, but, every, everyone heals in, in different ways. I love that. Uh, you were able to do all that healing just naturally. And you said it was energy work too. And I, I love Reiki. Or, like, did you have Reiki? Oh yeah. Just, and I just saw a lot of, a lot of healers and, That's and then just tough. a lot of, and a lot of work on myself just through being out in nature, hiking, um, a lot of just wonderful spiritual people that came into my life and just, you know, being able to have deep conversations and just release a lot of past stuff. But de definitely, I got worked on. I mean, I am a big believer of that. We, you know, we hold, as you know, trauma in our body. So I oh, always yeah. had a lot of body work, rolfing work, Heller work. I mean, just um, energy work. I mean, it's just acupuncture. I mean, for years yeah. I have, um, and it's, you know, especially rolfing was the one uh, modality that really helped me release a lot of trauma in my body. Could you explain uh -huh. that? I'm, I'm actually, I just, I don't sound, it doesn't sound too familiar to me. Could you explain what that is? Well, Rolfing, it's uh, Ida Rolf is the lady that uh, is the founder of 
of rolfing and they have a school they might have more schools but the one uh, school was in Colorado and what it is is fascia covers our body look at it as a fish net that just covers all our muscle right so if there is anything that is bunched up in that fascia it's going to inhibit movement right it's going to inhibit things moving and flowing and energy too it's you know stagnant energy as well as how your joints move and the function of your body so what rolfing will do is go in there and open up that fascia and bring it back to its natural state it's like you know our bodies are in a sense plastic right so we can get in there and, and move and transform things and so when that happens you're going to release some energy so you know if there's been trauma in there it's going to it's going to be released wow and it's a little different it's a different technique than like deep tissue massage or massage okay um, and so just you know you can research it but yeah that's something absolutely. i've done for like 30 years and it's um it's been um it's been awesome for me on a lot of levels physical emotional yeah that's um, amazing no thanks for sharing that i've actually never heard of that we'll have to look that up yeah and there's different practitioners and there's a series you can do where they work on different parts of your body like a 12 series and then there's also i mean you just get specific work done you know whatever's going on with you but it's all connected you know if there's something going on with your foot there's probably something going on with your shoulder you know it's like it's all kind of connected so yeah um, man well but you, yeah but go ahead yeah go ahead no go ahead um no so yeah i just done maui and just i got into a lot of right i went back to college when i went to maui i can't sit still i mean <laughs> i uh, i can't I, I mean the the novelty of you know swimming going to the beach meditating hiking i mean i just felt like i needed to get back on board with uh, more of a purpose and so i went to college for psychology but my third year going back i decided i'm not going through this big school thing to get a degree to go to work so that's when i decided to get more into uh, coaching and personal training um, because i said i can take my natural skills and ability which i've always had see with sales i always get went much deeper with people i mm -hmm. always was connecting to them on a deeper more spiritual level and them telling me everything about them and, and that's the thing like i can sit down with somebody and just feel their energy and i'm going to get all the information about that person i don't call yep. it really psychic i just it's a gift i've had since i've been a little kid mm -hmm. so i you know and a lot of times i'll see things and everything but i really ask only to be able to see what i can help people with because mm -hmm. i was starting to see entities and other things around people and other dimensions but it kind of was a distraction for me i mean some people kind of maybe they like that and maybe want to go deeper into that but for me i'm like i only want to see things that i know that i can help people and if i you know these other dimensions are going there because as well as good stuff there's dark stuff out there too which i found and that's mm -hmm. you know kind of when i shut it down for my i just asked god to remove it from me wow and, wow um but in saying that I have this gift, right? So I thought, all right, I want to work with people that want to change because what I realized being a therapist, a lot of times you're just working with people that just want to stay where they're at. Yeah. But I thought, yeah. I love the body and I love the fitness and I thought, you know, I'll use the body as the medium. You start moving people, moving their energy, getting them feeling better, looking better, and then of course they start opening up and then I can also engage what's going on inside them. And always, of course, connecting them to their spirit. See, that's my thing. You know, my thing is, you know, being a catalyst for people to start their inner journey. Oh. And to know that, you know, all the answers, all the solutions, your strengths, your purpose. I mean, that's just that we all have, we have it all already. We were born and blessed with it at birth. I mean, it's just, yes. and that's my philosophy. And so it's always for me is bringing people in. And then of course, you know, you got to have faith, you have to have courage and you have to have discipline for this faith because you might not believe it, but you feel it. So you take the action. Right. And then the courage to work through the shit that comes up, your trauma, limiting beliefs, your fear, whatever that is going, you know, your darkness, if you want to call your shadows. And then um, and then the discipline, because it takes daily discipline to be conscious of your thoughts, of how you feel, of your behaviors and what you're thinking. And if you want to reprogram yourself, you must repetitiously mm. basically reprogram yourself with your purpose, with positivity and, and so on and your affirmations and your gratitude. And, you know, that's part of my program, you know, your morning and evening rituals. And so um, it's if you don't set yourself up for that unconsciously, you will just go back to your old ways. I mean, 
you know, th- we're living in a day where people are still looking for the quick fix. You know, you see it on the inter- you know, the Instagram or the, you, I mean, everyone's selling their path and, you know, and, and there's a lot of great stuff out there, but it, <laughs> you're talking to somebody who was a hardcore drug addict and has been on this journey for 30 years. Yeah. And I still need to have my daily practices, my rituals and habits on a daily basis, or I will slide. I mean, early on, early on in my recovery, I ended up having eating disorders. I had bulimia, I had some anorexia. And then, you know, I caught myself because I'm like, Jesus, I'm just going down the same path. I'm abusing myself and this is going to take away from my life. It's going to sabotage things. I did competitive uh, cycling and running. And another thing, I was out in the bike for six hours. Yeah, the dopamine surge and everything felt really good. It was, it was like, instead of drugs, it was that. But I was not going to work anymore and I wasn't doing anything. So I was escaping still yeah. through exercise. I mean, fitness is a part of my thing for the brain and the body. It's one of my seven disciplines that I teach people that on my gift of addiction program. But there's if you're going to exercise six, seven, eight hours a day, I mean, come on, that's that's an addiction. And my definition of addiction, guys, is something that takes you away from yourself. It ne- negatively impacts you and the life around you but you can't stop yeah. that mm. and because what's happening is everything's falling apart but you're still just into your addiction you're not going to do that a normal person's not going to do that <laughs> they're going to go wow. oh that's falling apart my health oh, look at this relationship my work stuff i mean everything's just but you're, you're hanging on to that addiction wow that is amazing man so uh what would you so you, you would contribute a lot of your healing to first off sounds like God, your, your, your connection to spirit. And yes. then a lot of the energy work and Reiki and, uh, Rolfing and all that stuff you did down in Maui. And then your, your, your program that you actually created the gift of addiction yes. program, which is your routines. That was what you would consider what heals you and is healing well, too. Is Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I do believe we all have within us the opportunity to self heal, but this is what happens too. You, I'm a big believer I mean, I don't, it's a big believer. It is what it is. So it's a law. It's a universal law. The law of attraction. You know, we are, are, we are experiencing what we're thinking and feeling. And what we do, of course, are actually, I mean, it's, it's happening. If you're conscious of it or not, what, that's what people understand. It's like, you know, for instance, I got hit by a car, um, walking across the street just over a month ago. I'm lucky. I'm actually lucky to be alive. I, I, I got a, I have a fractured back. I've been able to work out since it happened. So no. I've kind of been working through that. And but when something like that happens, I'm like, okay, you know what? I manifested that. You know, that yeah. might be hard for me. Well, Sean, someone hit you. And it's like, no, but energetically, yeah. I attracted that car to hit me. And I know this. Yeah. I'm very in tune with energy. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, it's it's so what am I not paying attention to in my life? Or what am I not? moving forward with what where am i staying in fear where do i need to wake up where do i need to pay attention it's not even like slowing down it's really priority like where is my energy going where are my thoughts how am i feeling and i've been i've been really down this winter because it's been dark up here um some things have been going on my my own son has been fighting depression so i just been kind of like you know not in my highest place right yeah so um you know getting hit by this car it's like you know what I could have been dead. I'm not dead. I am going to heal. I'm going to recover. But it's just a wake up call to like, what am I doing with my life? And for me, you know, the gym stuff is easy. You know, I've always been successful with training. I want to have my gym in LA, but moving into putting my gift of addiction out globally has been something that I've gone through my, my struggles with believing in mm-hmm. myself, believing in my process. And so, um, and I know that's part of this, this whole thing. So, um, you know, there's no mistakes. I'm talking to you guys too about this. So, um, so <laughs> wow. I guess my point being is there's always another level. People don't realize it. it's a, it's a daily practice of being conscious, but it's a lifelong journey. And every time you evolve or go to that next level, there is going to be some, still some limiting beliefs or uncomfortable stuff or fear. And, and, you know, what I tell people is this, when you take away your addiction, you still have your early childhood trauma. You still have your survival, your kind of disconnection, isolation, and you still have your limited beliefs. So how do you think you're going to get well by just taking away your addictions? You're not. You have to fill that with your true, your inner life. You have to fill that with 
your inner guidance. You have to fill that with your gift, as I call it, your purpose. You have to fill it with love, and that mm. is the journey. And through that process, what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? You are going to be guided to unpositive, uncomfortable situations <laughs> because we're、uh, subconsciously you're wired. Going in your negative loop, right? Your limited beliefs. You this. You're going up relationships. This happens. You get back in your addiction. Blah blah blah. You know, maybe you have a little success over here for a while, so you hold on to that. But the rest of your life is in shambles because you haven't done your healing work, and you keep going back to your addictions, whatever they are. So you're like, okay, I'm going to get rid of my addictions. My cravings are away. So you're raw and you're real. And then you're being guided to these positive things. Things that you're being guided to because you're like, well. You know, my my inner guidance or my inner voice is saying we're going to go this direction, and it feels right, but it's scary as hell. So, what do you want to do? You want to run right back to what's comfortable, even though it's painful. It's more comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God.、So、yes. That's where, it, and it, and that's why it, it takes the faith, and it takes the courage,、mm. and it takes the discipline, and it is hard work. That's why it's such BS. That you're gonna go do some weekend workshop and transform your freaking life. Now, I say you can begin the journey, going to some weekend workshop. You can be excited. You can make the decision to change. But that is just the beginning of the transformation.、But、yeah. You gotta do the. You gotta do the work, and no one really talks about it. Some people、yeah. do, but very few. It's all the hype. We just want to sell people on. You're gonna transform your life. You're gonna be your future self tomorrow, and it's like. You know, it's a daily practice. Oh yeah. Yes, you set your intentions. Yes, you set your goals. Yes, you have your dreams. But let me tell you something. If you have how many years of negative thought processes, and in one day you're just going to change that? Hell no. It's going to come up. You're not going to even know. That's why you have to be conscious on a daily、mm -hmm. basis, and then set yourself up with the structure and the personal accountability that keeps you on your path. Because when you veer off, like for me, if I veer off a little bit, something that might de used to derail me years ago for maybe what, Sean?、Um, yeah, okay, you can you, you can get right back on track. And the thing about it is, the connection is always there. You just got to turn the lights on. A lot of times, people, and that's why daily meditation, or I call it quiet time. You know, if you're not comfortable, with it, just where you quiet the mind. And you go within, and you have that. You develop that relationship with thyself, that inner voice. You want to call it your soul, your spirit, your God voice, your heart voice, and that is where the magic is. And then for me, pen to paper is a big thing that I teach people, because what's within you when you ask questions will come right out on paper, pen to paper. Realized with that stream of consciousness, your truth will just come out on paper. Now, Love again, it. it always comes out to action, guys. It's always about action because we can think good thoughts, we can feel good things, we can have great ideas, as you know. But it's the follow through. Yep. Then yep. that's what builds more momentum, more situation experiences, and people will come into your life to support you on your journey and in, in you know achieving your intentions and goals. And so Dude, that was that was freaking awesome. We have about three minutes left on this I thing. I know, <laughs> there's so much to cover, man. I'm I'm sorry. I probably just no. This is、them. awesome. But no,、um, this is amazing because I'm resonating with everything that you're saying. I'm loving it. And then I guess the last thing I'll say, because it comes, it feels so true to me, is you know the healing journey to loving yourself. And what I talk, I have an eight week course, and I talk about this. And what I share is, if you were to ask yourself, "Are you loving yourself?" and go through all the different areas, you will get that answer. And then, if you're not, what would it look like and feel like if you were loving yourself in air in the area? And what do you need to do action-wise to make that happen? Because I tell、it. you what, if you ask yourself before you eat something, "Is this loving myself?" you'll know right away how much、yeah. <laughs> this relationship. How many? I mean, it's kind of it's so simple, but it's true. And you know,、yeah. are you willing to have the courage though to make those changes? But yeah, honestly,、man. are you loving yourself? Are you loving yourself with your work? Do you love what you do? Are you loving、yep. yourself with your health? You know, are you getting your exercise in? Are you, you know, doing your mental meditation? Are you, you know, do you love yourself in your relationship? Are you loving your partner, your kids? You know, because what is that? Your truth will come through you. Now,、yeah. do you have the courage to act on it and make things priorities? That's your choice. 
But if you ask yourself that simple question, and that's what I would would, would do early on in my recovery, am I loving myself? That's awesome, man. That is so real and so powerful. Well, got one. We got a little less than a minute left. Where can they get in touch with you, Sean? Uh, what do you got going on? Plug well, yourself. you know, Let's honestly, <laughs> I will have. I'm going to be working on a, a website for my gift of addiction. But right now, my Instagram platform is really the one platform for me. And then, I mean, I have a website for my gym, but that's local here for um, Bellevue, Washington. Which, but I would say, you know, my right now, my Instagram. I'm going to get my YouTube going again. It's been kind of in hiatus, but um, perfect. My Instagram, Sean Casey underscore, and uh, if you want to DM me, message me. I think my my phone number's on there. If you ever want to just text me, and um, you know, my whole thing is you know, guiding people to their source within them that has all that they need for all that they desire and want in life. It's, you already have it, it's in you. And to have the faith, the courage and the discipline to follow through and live it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you so, Sean, thank you so, so much for coming on here. This was amazing, this, this was, is gonna help so many people, dude. <laughs> dude, so many people need to hear this, we're pumped. We're gonna put a link to your, to your Instagram profile when we publish this in a few weeks. Thank you so much again right. for your time, Sean. All right, guys. Have a great Thank day. you, Megan. Yeah. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Happy, Happy you. healing. Bye. Hey. Hey, guys. Yep. How are you? Hey. Good, good. We're so happy to have you back on. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's quick. <laughs> quick turnaround. Um, I know it. Well, I'll do my little intro here. Uh, okay. Welcome, everyone, to the Magical uh, Stories of Healing and Spiritual Gifts podcast. I'm David here with my lovely wife, Megan. Hi, y'all. And we are bringing Sean Casey, the man, the myth, the legend, back on. We had such an awesome, awesome first podcast. And, man, we even got off it. We are like, whoa, that was <laughs> awesome. I know. You're just I'm a- like, you don't even have to hardly ask him anything. I know. <laughs> Uh, you yeah. we lead the questions like you just ran with it and you're such you're such a you're so well spoken oh, in your, your story and well, uh, hey man, guys, thank you for- how's everybody doing <laughs> um yeah I, <laughs> well when i got off the call that's what i thought i had gosh i did all the talking and i know i'm <laughs> your guest but sometimes there's interaction you know so i was like you know i wasn't getting any of their insights or their feedback and, and then i thought you know I talked a lot about my story, a little bit more about my my past, and I'm always wondering, well, gosh, did I get into more the solution, more, you know, the the journey of, you know, overcoming addiction, going through my healing, and, uh, you know, all the uh, the gifts that have taken place, you know, since that day 30 years ago, as well as the challenges, because, you know, I want to say just because you quit your addictions doesn't mean you get well doesn't mean your life right. gets better you know for a lot of people yeah. their life will continue to spiral downward because <clears throat> of not going through their their healing process or even having an understanding of how that works they just think well gosh I'm, I, I know this is bad for me my life is unraveling <clears throat> and uh, you know if I quit my addiction my life's just going to get better. And, and for a lot of us and myself included, initially, it got worse. You know, emotionally, I was, you know, I went through depression and, you know, I was still, you know, searching for something to escape with. And I knew it wasn't going to be drugs or alcohol because, you know, I made that commitment. I also made that conscious commitment to following my inner guidance. And, and so it was about honoring my truth. And then, like I talked about last week, you know, I really, when I get honest with myself, you know, it, it, the healing journey to loving myself just stays true over and over again. Mm. Um, because let's face it, most of us, you know, all of us have dealt with some kind of trauma. People that have had hardcore addiction, probably a little more intensity from what I've read and learned from you know, people that have done the deep research on this uh, subject matter of addiction and trauma. So that being said, uh, people that have a lot more intense trauma, just letting go of the addiction, you're going to have a lot of raw and real feelings, right? 
Um, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and that's why it's it's hard. It's it's really, really, really yeah. hard. And to stay the course. And, and that's why for, you know, a lot of people in the kind of a recovery uh, community, you know, a lot of it is, you know, how long have I been in recovery or how long have I been abstinent? And, you know, for me, <clears throat> I've had wonderful experiences in my life and have been on, you know, success in all areas and healthy. And, and, and then there's been other times where, gosh, I've been down in the dark, man, depressed, not for as long because I have the tools today, but you know, you're still going to be, you're still going to go through the challenges, man. I mean, that's life, right? And that's amazing to hear from someone like you because, you know, and just coming from the outside, I mean, man, I know we've only kind of met over Instagram outside of this, but you know, you have so much awesome motivational stuff. You're so raw, you're so real and you know, you're successful. You've overcome addiction. You have a family, you have a incredible son. You have all these successes uh, to hear someone like you say, man, the journey's not over. Like I still go through it and you know, I've overcome addiction, but that doesn't mean it was just smooth sailing. Like it's, it's such a beautiful thing because you know, I feel like society paints this false sense of everyone being happy oh, or yeah. people just because they're successful, they're happy. And you hit on, first of all, I really appreciate your vulnerability and everything you spoke about on the first one, man. Even like the, the drug stuff, the prostitution stuff, all oh, this. Yeah. I mean, that's so vulnerable. Oh, yeah, and man. man, like people don't talk about that. Well, and no. I resonate when you said that, you know, once you become clean, then you have to like feel everything. Oh, yeah. You know, I, doctors, my trauma was horrible and... For me, weed was my my coping thing. Okay. But doc, doctors put me on Xanax and Klonopin oh. off and on for twenty years. Oh, twenty wow. years, dude. Twenty years. Oh. And and so even though I wasn't like, if I missed a day, I wasn't like, oh my god, where's my Xanax? Right. But I was only because my body became physically dependent oh, yes. on it. If I had two days in a row, if I traveled for work and I was like, oh shit, I forgot it, then I was gonna have like, might as well have the flu. You know right. what I mean? Oh yeah. And, but when I with the grace of God and David, I got off of it. And man, I, mm. all these things, I was like, Oh my God, is this like how I would have been feeling all these oh, 20 yeah. years? And I was just masking it. And it was hard. It was, right. it was intense. It was a lot. So like, I totally like, I, I get it what you're saying. Yeah, man. No, and so yeah. I pre pre appreciate that part. And I love one thing to, I'm jumping around so much, but you said okay. you had so many freaking nuggets. You had so many nuggets that, uh, you mentioned the journey to loving yourself Yes. and man, that's, 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 I can't put the importance on that so uh, more because you talk about the programming as a child and everything you go through as a child with your family or trauma right. and everything. One of the deepest programming things I think that we all go through to some extent, um, but some much deeper than others, especially those with trauma or and or addiction, is truly knowing how to love yourself and oh, be yeah. happy with yourself, right. accept yourself and not be worried at all about others. You know, I think to an extent, everyone kind of holds on to some aspect of worrying what oh, others yes. think even if you say you don't we all do to an extent right. but at least at least being able to get to the point where it no longer affects your day to day i mean that's the, right. such a journey and so tough well <clears throat> as you said you know our childhood and <clears throat> if we are coming from an abusive family background and those are our first caretakers those are mm. the people the authority figures that are supposed to love us support us protect us and if those are abusers from the get-go, how are we going to feel like we're even lovable? Something must be wrong with us, right? Mm. So we oh, carry that on the rest so of our, our life. I mean, we and have it be <clears throat> in a relationship with your significant other, you know, your partner, or girlfriend, or, or wife or husband, but even you know your relationships with your leaders at work and your. Co I mean, this stuff spills over into all areas of your life when you're talking yeah. about trauma. I mean. And I saw that happening to me over and over and over again. And even if you quit your addiction, it doesn't mean you still don't have those same stories locked in your subconscious mind about people, the way the people you think think about you and how you feel about people. I mean, it's just similar energy, certain energies just trigger you so already you're you're thinking oh that person doesn't like me oh that person is an asshole or that person you know is somehow is just an enemy and so you have that 
So you've already predestined that whole experience yeah. with that person yeah. because of oh, because so of your real. programming. Because of your programming. And yes. so that's yeah. why I talked about, you know, ha- being it a daily practice of being conscious. Because you mm. must be conscious of those limiting beliefs and those stories. Because if you don't, you'll you'll just continue to do them. So you know, you can think, I'm gonna think positive, I'm gonna do my affirmations. I'm going to set my goals and I'm going to follow through and all that's great. But if you're not aware of how you actually are interacting or unconsciously those thoughts that are already hardwired in you, you will still run up against the wall and then you'll wonder why isn't things working? Why aren't things working? You know, I'm not doing the drugs, I'm not drinking or whatever your addiction is. but your life still isn't changing because you really haven't changed from the inside out yet. And so, yeah, yeah that, man, that's and for anyone listening, that's coming from someone that's a, a champion bodybuilder. I mean, absolutely ripped has his own company and coaches right. people. So, if it can happen to him, I mean, it to just understand that you're not alone if someone's listening out there and they feel that way. And that's why if someone doesn't have a path that they're on, like some personal accountability and structure in their life the chances of you getting well getting better and even staying off your addiction is so slim i mean the percentages are going to be so small and even if you do your life is still not going to be very fun and not very happy internally because you're still going to yeah. be carrying around all that trauma all those limiting beliefs it's in your body it's in your mind it's it's how you're wired. So that being said, yes, can you can you not only overcome your addiction but can you have a fun, loving, fulfilled life? Yes, you can, but it is going to take some work and you can't think of it long term either. You just got to chunk it down initially today. And you know that you hear about that a lot today. Just right now, right now, you know, I'm doing good and then, you know, you you will build on that though. You know, it's a, it's a process. It's like You know, people want overnight success everything or you want to go to like I talked touched on this last time like a weekend workshop. This is just going to change your life and maybe it can change the way you think and you can decide, yes, I'm going to make changes in life and start your process. But it is a it is a journey, guys. I mean, you can't it's not like in a blink of an eye you went from however you were as a kid and then whenever you got into your addiction, how many years day in and day out have you been living your life like that and then all of a sudden one day you're just going to change your life you can decide to change but before you really transform you're going to go through some stuff man and yeah that's why you can't do it with a broken brain and i talked about this yesterday and that's why for me you can say one way i used to say the only way but it's an inside job you got to go within And like we talked about before, religious or not, if you want to for me it was, you know, God, you know, and it's just listen. Yep. You're going to be guided. There's a truth within you, your soul, your spirit. Mm-hmm. And it's being conscious with that and then having the faith to follow through and the courage to work through the darkness when it shows up, if you want to call it your shadows because that's the process that unfolds. And so you need the tools of accountability. And that's what I do with people. I have that path. As I said, I have the seven daily disciplines which are, you know, your sleep, your nutrition, movement, exercise and breathing. And then we have quiet time which is you have it be meditation or just shutting off the mind, be going within, having that conscious connection, feeding your mind with good stuff, inspirational books, tapes, you know, workshop, anything that's going to kind of inspire you or support the journey you're on, that connection. And then pen to paper. I am a big believer in the magic comes when you put oh, pen to yeah. paper. And that have it be your affirmations, your gratitude, your goals, your priorities. Yes. Oh, But my also, gosh. Yeah. if you have something going on with you, just put pen to paper. If you're having a bad day or there's emotion, yeah. go with don't go away from your <clears throat> anger. Don't go away from your frustration or whatever it is. Right. Go, your truth is in there. All that stuff is is fear-based. Yep. And so within that fear mm-hmm. is your truth. And sometimes 
you can't articulate it but if you just kind of like put pen to paper it will go through you. you you know whatever it is or your solutions or your answers or you know whatever that story is and you know that you know might come through and you're like yeah that's not even true or maybe this new story that's through you your truth and so pen to paper is so powerful and it's something that i have used for decades and i encourage people to use it every day it's different than clicking it on your computer or your phone you're part of that it's an yes. energy thing um and we all know for goals too and manifesting i mean putting pen to paper is, yes. is the way to go um absolutely and first and then uh, the last uh, thing is just morning and evening rituals how you begin your day and how you end your day is very powerful too and it allows you to you are in our life man you are in our life you, yeah, I'm like, it's preach, crazy preach. this is yeah. the, like the exact stuff we're all about yeah. i love it so i didn't mean to no, interrupt you awesome. this is just so and, it's crazy how synchronous and, and you know yeah, we're doing good <laughs> you know i can't tell you what it is but for me personally and, and the, the people the many thousands of people i've worked with through the decades they will say there's something that happens when i just start going through my gratitude my affirmations and put pen to paper my yeah. energy just changes and when i don't do it my day is not as good it just is and so yes. yeah it's so it's kind of like it's you want to call you know a prescription for addiction or whatever but just that alone and then those tools because if you don't have that structure and personal accountability your unconscious mind will run wild it's just going to take off you don't even know what's happening and before you know it you're spiraling out you relax have some kind of major drama in your life that you know and it just it spirals and before you know it you're like, holy shit i'm right back in that damn place i've been for my whole life you know or how many years right yeah. and um when you yeah. have these tools what i believe is sure you're going to get off track but something that might be would have derailed you for a week a month or even a year maybe you within that day because you check in with yourself you set your alarm clock in your car it's 3 o'clock and you take a deep breath and you're like god how am i feeling what am i thinking about oh wow man i'm way over here with this no 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 that's let's just get back on track <laughs> go over a couple gratitude things life is good that's what awesome. are your intentions for the day and then if something's <laughs> bothering you that badly make a note of it and maybe revisit it later but get back on track you know that resentment you're so angry about somebody really That's your anger. I mean, that person just doing that. You know, what do you cuz that's a big one, man. Resentments are huge, right? Things that trigger us and we get angry and it's like, yeah. really? I mean, that person just did that. Why are you so angry? You like you want to rip his head off. I mean, or her, you know? It's like, <laughs> come on, man. Just it's nothing. Take a breath. You know, you want to call it the small stuff or what, but it's really owning. You got to learn to own. And that's the thing. One of my friends 100% responsibility for your life cuz so many people especially when you're coming off addiction because you want to blame your past you want to blame these people in your life they are the ones holding you back they're the ones why you know you don't have a better relationship or more money or the better job or whatever it is right so having those personal accountability tools are so valuable and it's going to be the difference between you really being able to transform your life or not and um So this is what I have if you I'm just going to run down really quickly guys and I'm like my 12 kind of life principles if you want like long term recovery and healing in your life and so my first one is really making that personal kind of conscious commitment to connecting you know I call it your life within you your gift you're going to making that conscious connection with the life within you your spiritual uh kind of journey. And then number 2 is I talk about, you know, source energy, universal energy. We are all connected to this energy. Or if you want some people if you want to call it, I put kind of spirituality. Brené Brown talks about that, you know, cuz there's a lot of religions, but there's just something that we're all connected to within us, whatever your beliefs to. And that yeah. for recovery in your journey, you just you, you become conscious of that. You need to And then of course number 3 is huge for all of us but especially people the trauma is that love and connection. And like I said it believes it starts with you know loving yourself but then having those relationships that connection with 
you know, community with other people, like-minded people like yourself, have it be family and, and having that, that love and that connection because we as human beings desire, but especially for people that have never had that and have just had that, you know, abuse, like you talk about Megan, um, don't you agree with that? I mean, you know, yeah. we desire, we desire. Uh, yeah. To, I mean, I agree with everything right. we, you des- say. we desire to be loved. I know for me, you know, I found love in the wrong places early on, but it was attention. Right. So, uh, you know, of, of course, but yep. for me, it was like wanting to be loved for me, the real me for no other thing. Right. And that, you know, let's face it, right. you know, you, there's, there's, it's out there, but it's, if you find it, man, you keep those people in your life. Right. So then, yeah. uh, then yeah, four, number four, I have daily gratitude and appreciation for, for what you have. And we know we've heard a lot about that over the years and everyone talks about it, but it's true. Um, that daily gratitude and appreciation yep. yeah. for all that you have now. Um, and then number five is intuition and inner guidance. And that is huge. Um, following your inner guidance, getting in touch with your intuition, um, letting that be kind of the guiding force in your life and not letting your mind or limited beliefs, you know, kind of cancel that out or hold you back. Because I think that's so powerful, man. It's it's so powerful. There's it's interesting because I've I've always I don't know. Some people just tend to be better about that. Like Megan has been so freaking intuitive. It's crazy. And she has this powerful connection oh, yeah. with her guidance. I'm still I'm good. Um, but it's been a journey for me okay. to get that. And I'm still like clouded by my like lizard brain <laughs> at times. Um, so I, it doesn't come as naturally to me. Um, but man, that's just such a powerful one. I've been trying to get better and better at following and trusting that, not in the physical, right. uh, like she's so, so good at. But I, I love no, that. No, it's, it's true. And it's a practice, man. I think it's like anything. Some It's kind of like a natural thing, right? For some people, it's just, it's been there and they're connected. And then some people, they got to work at it, but the, right. the more you practice, the better you get. So those are, those are, so yeah. the num- number uh, six is faith and beliefs. And the reason I put those together is because faith is taking action with not really understanding how it's going to work or the outcome, right? It's just, again, that inner guidance, that intuition, you just feel like, gosh, this is right. I know this opportunity this person I, I need to meet this person yeah. you know I'm just gonna make this move in my life I'm gonna take that job or you know I've always wanted to I'm being guided to a sunnier spot and I'm just mm-hmm. gonna do it or that relationship or that person you're gonna set up a meeting or maybe you're gonna do that live workshop or you know whatever it could be out of this world but it's like you know what it just feels so right no matter what I think yeah. so not letting your limiting beliefs hold you back and then of course you know your beliefs you know your beliefs if you can set the biggest hugest goal and dream and i talk about this all the time and you go to these seminars dream big you know and live your best life and i'm gonna be a billionaire tomorrow you know and and that's awesome you know and and you could have that it might not happen overnight but my point being is if you do not believe within yourself no matter if you write that goal down say it if that deep inner thing in your brain it's like you're figuring out how or you get stressed out or you just don't know how it's going to happen it never will and they don't talk about that so your beliefs and faith faith going on when you don't know the outcome and then of course your limiting belief and then your (laughs) beliefs like believing in yourself and in your cause and whatever your you know dreams and vision is um, it's so important yeah. and, and we could get into that. Yeah. Like the, in the strength of your belief, your faith, Right. I always say, you know, your faith will make it. Yes. So, I mean, that's just, it's huge. So, yes. and then I have number seven is taking a hundred percent responsibility for your life. And we, we touched on that a little bit, not blaming anything outside yep. of yourself for your circumstances and where you're at that, you know, you are responsible for your happiness, your joy, your fulfillment, your abundance. And the funny thing about it is we all have it. It's already, we've been born and blessed with it at birth. So it's actually just going in within yourself, getting it, and then taking that guidance and fulfilling it in the real world physically, you know, because we're all blessed with farther. And that's, it's the cool thing, right? It's like, we are connected to the infinite mind. It's like all the greatest minds, anything that's ever happened in the history of the universe, we are connected. So if we want that answer, If we want that solution to whatever we're going through, if we go within ourselves and tap into that consciously, 
we'll go. It's even better than Google, really. And so, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, absolutely, not absolutely, not a bad thing either. But does I mean does um, how does that concept resonate with you guys? Just knowing that we're all part of it and we all have everything and anything we want within us. I, I I love oh, that. Oh no, I I'm a powerful manifester, and I know that anything I want to do or be or have, like done. So I I, I get it. That's yeah. why meditation has been so big. Like that's another thing that it's taken me a long time to like fully get into. But meditation's absolutely instrumental because that is quieting the mind and going within and like tapping into that and asking a question, then just right. listening and feeling what. Is. Yeah, no, it's 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 awesome, and it's um, yeah, and you know what? We're it's it's cool because even myself, like, I'll be on track and on track and on track, but then sometimes I'll be going through something. I'm like, what are you doing, Sean? What are you holding on to here? What what's this fear <laughs> crap here? What's limiting? You know, you just know yeah. you own it. You have the truth. Just and then it's the it always comes down to the action because you can know all you want, but if you don't go out yeah. and execute it. You just stay in that same place, even though you know the truth. You know what the answer is, and you know what that next move is in your life. You're like, why am I choosing to suffer in this anxiety and fear? Right? <laughs> right. So and true. And then you take man. the action. So you're like, true. crap! And I yeah, should have done yeah. that three months ago, a year ago, or maybe a few days, depending on how long you've been sitting with something. Right. So. Well, I'm like the only limits we have are the ones we put right. on ourselves. Exactly. So. So the next one is mastering your thoughts and reprogramming your subconscious mind. And so, for anyone that's working through their addiction and trauma and healing, this is huge because once you can master your thoughts, you can master your life. And I mean, it is a process. Yeah, it is a process of being conscious because again, you have to be conscious of the things that come up, <laughs> that have been coming up unconscious in your life from your subconscious, right? And so again, it's not only being aware right, of yeah. what you want, and where you're being guided to, but also those things that have been so deeply programmed in your subconscious mind that have been holding you back. So I go through all these. I go through a whole process of how to do that. These, are, but these principles are happening in our life at all days, right? We're always thinking and we're feeling, right? And then we're taking action. So, and then what shows up in our life? We know energetically whatever we're thinking and feeling. Those are the experiences we're having in our life. So if we want to change those, we got to you know change our thoughts because our thoughts can stimulate things. And sometimes it's the other way. You get emotionally triggered. You're actually your emotions, and then you think the experience because our emotions. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You know the body holds the truth. The body holds on to all our experiences. And so sometimes when we're emotionally triggered. We're actually feeling the emotion before the thought even comes. So anyway. Wow. So the next one is just that it's mastering. You know, the body holds the truth, and so what I mean by that is、mm. you know, within us, in our cells, all our experience, all that. But it also, you know, within our body holds the truth that's beyond those limiting things and the things that are in our body. So that's why, for me, you know, the exercise, the movement, and going through healing, getting certain body work, energy work. Anything where you're moving the body and breathing, you are going to be releasing energy, and to me, that is a huge part of your healing process, and also, you know, just feeling optimal in your mind and your body. You know, moving and breathing and becoming more conscious and more sensitive. Oh yeah. But the body holds the truth, and there's a good book called "The Body Keeps the Score," and、um, that's by a guy over in、uh, where is he? Basil, and he's over in Europe somewhere. But it's a really famous book, and it's it's all about the brain, mind, and body, and the healing of trauma. But he, you know, it's similar. So, you know, the body holds the truth. And then, of course, after that, I talk about、um, healing the emotional triggers, healing your trauma and your coping mechanisms. Because let's face it, when you're emotionally triggered. We have certain coping mechanisms, <laughs> and so before, oh yeah, it's yeah, like automatic. It was we're gonna go get high, we're gonna go do this, we're gonna have sex, whatever the thing is, we're gonna go shopping, maybe we're gonna get on social media for three hours, we're gonna binge watch this. I mean, it, you know, depending on whatever that addiction is, where you're escaping from yourself, you're feeling, and sometimes you know it can be a happy feeling. You know, you're feeling great, top of the world. I want more. So then you go out and you, 
you know, go, some women like to go shopping, or you know, some like to do whatever, right? Whatever that addiction is. And so, yeah, you have to become aware of that emotion before you act. So I go into a whole thing about, you know, being able to take that hyper view and take a step back or to, you know, let those emotions come and go. I think it's like 90 seconds, uh, research says, you know, when an emotion comes, it kind of takes over your body. And if you can just breathe and sit with it, you're able to release that and it'll just kind of come and go. And, you know, we do that in meditation, right? You let those thoughts just keep coming, keep coming and going. You keep breathing it up. And, you know, over time, you know, you'll empty your mind, but it's not being, the thing is not getting attached to those emotions right mm -hmm. to knowing that just emotions the right. emotions we feel this way we don't have to let yeah. it take us over yeah. and then we don't have to you know we can have different coping mechanisms too we can have healthy coping mechanisms so healing your trauma emotional triggers and coping mechanisms i love that too because so many people will have the emotion and they because they're not aware that they think they are the emotion right but you're not the emotion and you can do like self-talk right. exercises uh with people like not i instead of saying i'm depressed i feel right. depressed like but i am happy and healthy and you can use affirmations to turn that around instead of saying i am whatever the feeling is say right. i'm just feeling this way instead of I because what happens is too is once that overtakes you then that can sit with you for a while but then what happens is then you're the, the feeling oh, then yeah. those stories come in of why you feel that way that aren't yep. even true then you're affirming so again so anyway the next one i have and I, I for a while i was gonna take it out but i thought you know i'm a big believer in the law of attraction and there's 12 principles and laws yeah. universal laws that we that happen regardless if you're conscious of it or not but i just think it's a big one you know it's just what you think, what you feel, what you do. Yes. Oh. It's showing up in your life over and yes. over again. And it's, a lot of people don't realize the law of attraction, guys, is always working. It's just not working when you're trying to yeah. manifest something. Yeah. It's, you know? <laughs> right. It's, it's true, right. though. Like, the law of attraction so is always working. So if you're having, like, if you're going through a bad patch, as you think, like, things just aren't working out in business, you know, you're at, at wit's end with your kids and your wife or, you know, somehow your finances, I mean, it's just like, you gotta just take a minute, step back. It's like, what is going on with me? What am I doing to do this? Again, take responsibility. If something isn't going right, right and things aren't, you know, happening well, it's like, okay, it, it's because of you. So you need to shift the way you're thinking and feeling yeah. and what you're doing, you know? And so the law of attraction is huge. And yeah, so, yep. and last but not least is, giving back to others because once you start your journey mm. and you gain wisdom and knowledge and insights to life you know you eventually become a leader and you know to me it's always about giving back giving what i have giving what i have a way to you know empower others to do great things in their life or to start their journey or give them you know my own insights and stories to something they're going through right um, I believe everyone has their own journey to live and their own truth, right? So it's not about me telling them anything other than giving them the tools to come up with their own solutions, but to be there, right? To support them, to share, to share our right. stories, even like this podcast, right? There's going to be people who listen to this, you know, what? They, if they take away and actually use the stuff we're talking about, it's going to change their life, you know? And so. Oh, 100%. So, oh my God. Like. Life so that's what we do, right? We give back what we have. So that's huge. So those are 12 principles. And what I do is I go within all those and I break them down. I do a bunch of exercises and I have, you know, what is, you know, love and connection? Well, what does it mean to love yourself? And I go through this and, you know, mastering your thoughts. So I talk about the conscious, unconscious, subconscious mind. So, but these things are all the things I just talked about. They're always happening. And so the, tw the seven disciplines plus your daily check-ins throughout the days that is the way that you consciously implement what we're talking about through those 12 principles the best way you can right the best possible way to be conscious of such as you know things um you know mastering your thoughts and you know taking responsibility for your life keeping that conscious connection following your intuition you know, your beliefs and faith. And, and so all that stuff is happening. So when you're more conscious of this all, 
you can make better choices, right? And you keep yourself on your path. So all these are checklists. So if you're going through your seven daily disciplines and then you're being conscious of the principles, <laughs> it's going to really be hard for you to fall off track that much. You have the tools and the power to yeah. get right back on track and to continue to you know grow and evolve you know to continue and um and i always say listen we're on the path and you're stuck you're challenged you will i i said you will attract the right people and situation experience in your life to help you on your journey we all do we always do it happens right so you yeah. can you know get people and if you yeah. need therapy or if you need a coach or you you know a book comes into your life or some I mean it it all happens for you so you know and then but most of all it's all within you it's that connection with your inner guide your god you know whatever you choose to call it with your spirit your soul that is it, that has it all for you you really you know you can go through your healing mostly with yourself as long as you have the faith and the courage to take the action and the discipline on a daily basis right your life will change but in that being said there are people that are here that will come into your life to help you you know your mentors your teachers and um your guider you know so that's been yeah. my oh man i i can't reiterate how important that is having that like you know having a having a mentor having a coach having something like that it's just oh, yeah. it's it's so important you know and it's i I've, I've found that you know Megan and I've been in the personal development or slash you know life she's been life coaching the past few years and it's you know people have a lot of oh, pride yeah. so they're afraid to like say i right. need help or i can and there's there's no pride in this game no. man you got to throw your ego out the yeah. door like there's no ego there's no pride trying to help each other out and walking each other home as Ram Ramdas right. says uh, everyone should right. have a mentor yeah, yeah everyone should well, like Brené Brown says you know it's it's about being vulnerable man you know you have to have those hard conversations yep. with yourself and then you have to be able to be vulnerable and express them to somebody you know you have to and you know the way i look at it is you know that's where the the safe and the trust come you know and that's the thing with me people know right like i have people coming to my life And a lot of times they'll come in because they want to get healthier, but I attract a lot of people that have trauma backgrounds and have addiction issues. That's why do you think that happens? Well, <laughs> because that's who I am. That's what I do. <laughs> it's my purpose. And so people right. want to come in and then when I hear their stories, it's like and then I start telling my story and I'm like, "Look at, we've come together for this reason. You didn't think you were going to meet a guy that's going to yep. work with you on these levels, did you?" And they're like, "No, I just wanted to start getting healthier and come." <laughs> but during the consultation, they start telling me i mean just the last client i had and and um she's <laughs> she had you know some trauma some sexual stuff everything her therapist and she came in there and she just thought i wanted to get shape and i said she goes when i talked on the phone she just goes she goes i got chills she goes i couldn't believe that i'm going to be able to work with somebody that knows what i'm going through and just understands me so it's just awesome it's just how it works right like the right people show up in our lives when we need them and when we're and when we're ready when we're ready to go to that next level of growth yep. and that's just like in business too anything wow that is so so true. again what so it comes true, down to man. paying attention being conscious of what's going on in our lives with intentions and also there's always so many opportunities in our life right in front of us we don't have to search they just show up and then it's taking action though right it's like <laughs> Oh man, I had a conversation with the guy at a restaurant and I'm like, "You know what? There's something about him. I do this all the time. I'm like, you know, the conversation you had and your experience in this area, I said, you know, I'd love to take you to coffee or lunch or something, you know? And I just do that all the time and it's kind of it's an amazing journey. Your life will just unfold in some magical ways if you lead your life like this, you know? Man, that's awesome. 12 powerful, powerful steps. I mean, you dropped some absolute gems in there man thank you so much for sharing that process with you and how long you've been coaching how long you've been doing the working on this um you? well i've been on our on our kind of a intentional raw level i mean for the coaching like for with addiction and everything really probably 25 years professionally probably 5 years into my recovery i mean you know just doing it i've been you know i've been doing this work even <laughs> my whole life i've had this gift of connecting with people right but as far as like life coaching yeah. and everything and I got my certifications even though I don't know the certifications are great framework but you know I think you you do your real work with your it just right. it's the magic happens when you're just 
Uh, it's a piece yeah. of paper. Yeah. As far as I'm so, concerned. but um, <laughs> where I saw, the, I'm like I'm overqualified yeah. at this point. But you know, you understand what I mean. I mean, it's great, but I think. Yeah, yeah, I know, you totally we, yeah, get yeah. it. So there's no cookie cutter, right? So, um, right. It, and as far as um, the gift of addiction, though, has all come together within only the, the last five years. Like, I didn't know that this was fully going to be my calling. And really, I, I've kind of not run away from it, but it was like, really? You know, because I don't... Because, see, I look at addiction in such a different way than most of the recovery community. I don't talk about it a yeah. lot. I don't talk about drugs. I don't talk about my past so much. The only reason I might bring it up or share with it is so people know I've been through it, you know, and I've been on this journey. Right. Um, but, you know, this is, I keep going into myself and this is my purpose. So then I came up with this process. But I've been, I've been doing a dance with this stuff for a good three to four years, meaning... I, you know, I could have been like fully putting this out, but I just, it's going to be, this is the year that, you know, on the internet and I'm going to get back on my YouTube channel and uh, my book's going to come out in a few months. My first, so my second book's right away is the workbook. So the first book, as I shared last week is more my story, more of a memoir, my insights, and then I'll put the seven disciplines and principles. But my second book is more going down all of them and doing like a, a dive, deeper dive into each of my principles and and then to share people how they implement it into their life and then I will actually too have a physical workbook journal type thing that I'll bring out so people can do that and then eventually an app but it's just uh, yeah the last five years I've kind of known about this gift of addiction but now it's like okay and it's behind the scenes this is hard work to develop systems and everything guys this is not my strength. You know, I've just had this within me. I've been doing this work for decades and it just comes naturally. But someone said like, listen, if you don't create systems, how can you put this in people's hands? You know, how can you get, let them take something away and use it in their life? So you, you need to do this. This is, or you don't, and you don't have a business. If you don't, then you're just one-on-one, -on -one, right? You're not going to be able to reach people globally. You're not going to be able to go and speak and break break it down i mean you can motivational talk but at the end of the talk if you don't have anything that's it it's just a talk oh yeah yep. yeah you know that's going to change when this book comes out man that's so awesome i'm and i immediate one of the first things that caught my eye um a couple years ago when i connected with you is this concept of gift of addiction because you know my experience with binge drinking and alcohol addiction uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not by any means, anyone listening, I'm not trashing the way society goes right. about um, alcohol yes. addiction or anything like that at all. If that works for you, that's freaking great. Dude, right. do what works for you. But I tried all that. Not any right. of it worked uh, right. for me, just personally for me. For me, it was more re literally reprogramming yes. the subconscious mind, focusing on what yes. I want to create, not what I want to let what go, was what was most yeah. important to me. Like it was all of this. And you know, it's interesting. I love the concept of gift of addiction. I think it's going to be well, huge, man. I think it's going to be huge yeah. because it's freaking stigmatized right now. Addiction is stigmatized yeah. and it can be a gift. I turned my addictive tendencies right. to my marriage, right. my right. business, to You put all that all energy the into things. the right stuff. And, what, and just so I'm clear, see, I didn't know that addiction was going to bring me to my gift. But when I dropped onto my knees... And I went within and asked God yeah. for guidance. It's like, I didn't know that the life within me is my, is the gift. It, the gift is already, the gift is within all of us. It's our life within us. And if we take that gift, yeah. bring it to our consciousness and live it, man, our life is going to be amazing because it already is within us. It's just actualizing it and becoming conscious of it and then living it. And that's the journey. That's where the healing takes place, right? Because we're going to be guided to those uncomfortable situations, just like me, creating this gift of addiction. You don't think this is uncomfortable? You don't think writing my book and my story? Man, I've been going, I've gone through some emotional roller coaster rides the last year and a half. I mean, for sure. Mm. And, and yeah, mm. and because I am somebody that all my life, being an athlete, being in sales before I ran my gym, and then even with my training, it's like it's all about achievement and numbers and production. And right. with this stuff, I haven't been able to right. produce. I have don't I have I've been in this creating <laughs> systems and behind the scenes and like okay how does this work and you know people come into my life and build and it's like 
some of it's given me a headache even going through my eight week course and getting up and being like a teacher it's like oh man i know but you know you got to have the what the why and the how and all this and you know it's just can can, <laughs> can i ask you can I ask you yes. a question about that do you think that part of it is this deep thing within you that is wanting it to be so perfect because it's your baby and it's like all of this stuff you're creating to put out there and there's this thing of perfection that you're worth that you're is it, you think it's something with that or am i no, totally off I mean, there for or, sure man or, i'm a human being there's they're not a piece of perfection <laughs> but just definitely and then of course there's this thing that i had i think it has to be a certain way which i know it doesn't have to be so much but it has to be a system you know however it is because that's all my people yeah. are like look at you know this stuff you've been doing this but we got to you know like people that have helped me they're like we got to get it out of you though so we can put all the pieces together like right. and so but yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's a little bit about, <laughs> i've had people that have known me since maui at 20 over 20 years ago and they're like you're not already out there doing this thing you know because this is <laughs> not the gift of addiction but my whole story writing my books and everything that has been yeah. with me for i've known this you know and, and some of it is you know 25 years ago it, obviously i wasn't ready you know or i, I would have done it so yeah. you know i'm in my process but i have definitely the last three or four years for sure been hard on myself like and but at the same time when you don't kind of know what you don't know like in this kind of in this arena you know some of that is just i don't have the experience of putting myself out in in some of these areas that i'm going to be putting myself in, out in this year right but that's when right i have to ask myself why are you focused on the house so much sean just do what you need to do and you'll right. attract the right situation right? right i know this but i'm just sharing with you this is what yes. i've been going through i have to give myself pep talks you know too. <laughs> so it's um but it's it's huge i mean i would love to you know even have a couple more people with me involved with this because I don't I'm somebody that like I like to have people that are strong in areas that I'm not to be part of the team just anything I have because I love that I love my people that as long as we're we all have the same vision right you know that you're in business and so but you want to yeah. have a team yep. that I am the kind of leader that's like yes I want this isn't about me this is about all of us and more than anything it's about the people that we're going to help you know and so Yeah, the impact. impact that's that's yep. what this is all about but i don't you know i can't this all this stuff and then the next phase i shared with last week you know is going to be the marketing aspect of all this you know because as we talked about on the internet there's there's good stuff out there but there's a lot of stuff that's not that good but these guys are killing it because they're marketing right so um you exactly. know this is a great yeah. product this is going to be and i just need to stay strong and again even me saying that you know i my belief and all my research i don't believe addictions a disease just that statement there if you went into like the aa community and the 12 step program they'd be up it's not a disease yes oh, it is oh man they'd be a cognitive dissident you know? to the extreme and degree i just believe again and that's not to say anything that 12 step hasn't done awesome for a lot of people that i am i not right. where i'm coming from guys yep. but what i want to say is you know addiction is not a life sentence it isn't um right and i also you know that's just it it's in how can some and it's not i think a disease creates victim it keeps it creates a victim mentality. man i was and you literally hit the nail on the head that's what i was i was just about to say the thing that to my core that bothers me about the and i know this is controversial but uh that bothers me to the core about this whole thing of being a disease is it takes your power yes. away it's a victim. you know your apps you hit the nail on the head yeah and their whole and part of the program is you're powerless and yes i get it but oh. but you're not i think you can yeah i think you can have right. power and the thing i always go back to is, i get it but but you're not it, the journey i've chosen why do i want to go drink because i never drank to just drink right i drank to escape so i oh, yeah. get it. why yep. would i take a bunch of pills 100%. why would i shoot dope in my arm i mean I wouldn't do that today because that's not who I am, you know? I then that's not the way yep. I'm going to deal with going through any kind of emotional stuff. I'm going to own it. I'm going to understand it. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to work through it and I'm going to keep moving forward. I mean, that's my whole process, right? So to, so it's like why would I even so I don't need to, but you know what? Like when I had my surgery, you know, and I couldn't even move and I was in so much pain, did I take some opiates for my pain? Yeah, I did. And you know what? 
I don't care. I'm not addicted to that crap, but I needed it. But, you know, in some circles, they might say, oh, man, you're an addict. How could you take pain pills? It's like, well, I couldn't <laughs> right. move. I was in pain. You know, I, I did. So there you go. <laughs> It's all about what they're used for. You, yes. it's like it's it's the use. It it can be used medicinally. Shoot, heroin can be used medicinally, right. but that doesn't mean that like it, you know you go off and do it ten well, times yes. in a weekend so, or something like that. There you go again with your belief systems. Whatever you believe, that's what you create in your life. So, anyway, and not to get on that rampage, but for me, that's part of my process. I believe that I need to make a strong stand on this about yeah. addiction not being a disease. And my program and what I believe is a process that will enable you to overcome your addictions, heal yeah. your trauma and reprogram your subconscious mind. And it's a journey. It's a lifelong journey. So um, that's 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 what I'm going to be. That's the work I'm doing the rest of my life. You know, this is going to this is going to be my legacy. That's awesome. And um, and my is vision so is to be global. Cool. My vision is to actually coach people to coach people with this process. You know, to be able to have a certification where they can do this work and have this platform and you know that's uh and then have places uh cities that have the um the resources to have a place where there's a platform with a gym and yoga and healthy food and where people can hang out and, and come together that um you know or you know on the same path and working through and and it doesn't have to be labeled as you have you know it doesn't have it's not about you being an addict to be there either right so um but just that place in your community that people that are working through and growing and together and to have that create to have that space you know and um because i think the, the brain and the body i mean it's all connected and, and we all know this and it's coming out more but you know i don't <laughs> you know i'm a firm believer is like you know what science doesn't need to prove everything guys i mean we know it in our hearts we know it in our souls you know <laughs> right. i mean th th that's another thing with today it's like if science doesn't prove it you know it's like well you know some things don't have to be proven you just feel better you know you're, you're growing you've you've evolved you're transforming your life you're doing these certain things i mean it works for you right that's all that matters yeah. you have no one to prove it to right. except so, yourself all right guy oh yeah <laughs> Of course, we didn't even talk about fatherhood and all that stuff. But we've been going on for a lot of good stuff. I was, uh, I'm looking but at my so, notes. Well, we yeah, we got about a, uh, got about ten minutes here. I'd love, well, I'd love to dive I just into feel that. Like that you. was my biggest gift, other than my recovery, was, you know, my son yeah. and being able to break the generations of abuse and addiction in my family. Because mm. when I track back. I mean, I come from, you know, my dad was Irish Catholic, a logical father. And so there's just generations yeah. trauma and addiction. And I was able to, you know, break that chain. I was able to give my son a loving, supportive childhood. Um, and the relationship with I have him today at 19 is beyond anything I could dream. Of. I mean, we have such a bond. Um, and that that's you know that alone just being able to experience that which i didn't it wasn't even on my my list right i didn't think i didn't even know was i going to get married yeah. was i going to have a family um but i did you know and that was because of my recovery my spiritual journey and my healing journey to loving myself that allowed me that gave me the opportunity to to have that and um yeah, so I mean, I really, that's, that's huge. And for anyone out there that was like me, you know, just struggling with, you know, relationships and, um, you know, it's, it's possible and you can, you know, with the right tools and the right mind, you can, um, you can have a awesome experience uh, with your kids. You know, you can break that chain because most of people that have been abused um, continue the abuse that's what they know that's what they give what they right, got you give what you got so i was able to go yeah. through enough healing 10 so years true. before um i had my son and so um that was you know as i said my greatest gift and also being able to be there when um, my ex-wife was sick with ms and hawaii and um you know being able to take responsibility for our family and to do all the right stuff and eventually move us from Hawaii to here and uh you know without losing my mind right 
Now, again, it's yeah, just, wow, you know, it's a whole other yeah. kind of battle. And then at toughness. 40 years old, pretty much starting business all over, walking down and handing out cards at Starbucks in the community, and just Sean Casey, this is who I am, what I do, you know, and you know, and <laughs> now the last 11 years, I've been, uh, I've had this successful uh, business right in downtown Bellevue and doing incredible work so Amazing. you know there's <laughs> you're always going to be challenged but if i didn't have the tools that i've had in my my journey and i just i wouldn't be able to um be where i am today um and then of course continuing to move forward Man. with um my my gift my vision of uh the gift of addiction to bring to uh bring to the world you know i always say we all have that gift within us and you know, it's not so much about me. You know, I was reminded this by a mentor of mine. And he said, you know, it's not the work isn't about you, man. It's, it's about it's about the people, man. It's about the people that you're that are waiting for you. You know, it actually kind of brings me to tears, man. Oh, yeah. It's just, you know, it's huge. And when you know you have that responsibility within you, man, it's, you know, it's it's yeah. you got to do it. You can't run from it. You can, but. I always say, what's my biggest fear? My biggest fear is like not being, you know, living long enough to to get this out and to live this, you know. And that's that's my truth right there. So, you know, that's we're... so powerful, man. You have no idea how many people you're already impacting, so. brother. Like, you, um, it's crazy, and you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, I got a message. I put a video up about it yesterday, and this lady um, randomly messaged me and messaged me a video of her son playing some music and she's like uh i had no clue who she was and she was like he unfortunately um took his life oh, earlier man. this month yeah. and she messaged me she was like he used to forward me all the stuff you wrote and you you all posted over the past like year like it really resonated wow with and i was like oh my he- gosh and i was like my first thought was damn he never reached out i never spoke to him he never reached out one time like i'm like man you know, whatever this light work that I feel like we all, especially you listening to your story, man, that this, it's such a responsibility. It's such a responsibility. It's so much bigger than just, you know, it's, it's, it's it is about us, but it's about the impact we're going to make on other people. There's people that lives, literally lives you're going to save that you don't even know yet. You have no clue. And there's people you're impacting just by making these beautiful ripples into the universe. Um, and it's so important, man. It's such a responsibility. You're so right. right. Hey, David, um, the sound went off a little bit with how you were speaking. I don't know if you were in the microphone or not. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, did you catch this? Yeah, I, I heard you. The, it was just, it's, the sound is just a little nasal. So I, I don't know if it was. Oh, I heard. I, no, I appreciate that. Oh, I heard what, it. I mean, I heard what. Yeah, can you hear yeah me everything's now? good. Thanks. Okay, uh, cool. Well, cool, did man. Take yeah, no, it. We got about two. Yeah, oh, unfortunately, geez, he did. yeah, unfortunately he did. I, I never, never spoke to him. He never reached out, but apparently he resonated. And it just made me think like, man, this purpose is so freaking oh, important. Yeah. And it's so much bigger than our ego. It's so much bigger than our fear of like putting it out there and taking a risk. It's like literally like, going to be saving people's right. lives. Like they don't even right. know it yet. Helping them heal themselves so right. they can save other people's lives. Why we were- why we're oh right yeah here. like this is what we're well that's it and that's you know? that's how i feel like my purpose is is to be a catalyst for people to start their inner journey and to find their gift and to live it i mean that's it is it's just giving people the that's amazing huh? that, that's oh yeah amazing. well yeah so anyway i thank you so much guys for having me on again and uh you know i hope for your listeners we we covered you know some good stuff and um yeah i look forward to uh watching your success and think grow your uh business podcast and whatever else you're growing <laughs> awesome man hey you too brother we're so honored to be uh listening to you before you freaking take off and uh, go global don't forget about us people whenever you go uh, when you're running the uh, world well, all right no we'll stay connected <laughs> we'll stay connected guys um love you guys and uh Absolutely. i look we forward will. to uh right, love you too brother yeah. Yeah. okay bye-bye have a good, happy healing, man. Happy, happy, happy healing. I like that.